Amen. So if I start the class with a tangent, is that technically a tangent? I'm just because you're not really deterring from. So I was just uh, noticing on this picture. I don't know if y'all can see it, um, but the irony of having a picture of a cross on the side of the Colosseum. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> that's, that's just very ironic, you know, because you know we're so used to seeing the cross that it, it's almost lost its meaning to us. I think in a lot of ways, it becomes the symbol of something good because of what it provided, but the reality is the cross is a symbol of something that was very horrible, and then to stick that on the side of the Colosseum where many, many horrible things happened to many, many Christians, I just I was thinking about that tonight, going, hmm, like, that's, uh, anyway, tangent over, let's jump into Romans chapter 7, so go ahead and open up your Bible. Actually, I don't think we quite finished 6, so... Uh, Romans chapter 6, um, we are looking for connections here. I won't worry about recapping the book uh, this evening, because we've done that almost every class so far, but at least let's recap chapter 6, which gets into this idea of new life. You know, We always use it to talk about, about baptism, because it talks about that there in verse 3 and following. But really, the focus is the new life that we have because of baptism, and that that new life should be identifiable by a very distinct characteristic. What is that? Because it's the opposite of life. You are dead to sin. All right, so that's the distinguishable characteristic that should be there which is the answer to them because the rhetorical or the, the hypothetical question that Paul has thrown out there is shall we do more sin so that we can have more grace? No, because if we truly have been recreated, if we are truly experiencing new life, if we are no longer the old man but are something new, well then that new life does not have sin as a part of it. That, that, that's the ideal. Now, we're going to talk about sin being a part of it before we're done, but the ideal is new life, no sin. That, that, that's what we're shooting for. Uh, and so if that is the case, then we cannot let sin reign in us. We can't let sin have control over us. We have to reign over it. And so, it, it, you know, Chris pointed that out last time. I think the, the key word there being what is reigning, you know, what is in control. And so there's that, that principle there. So that brings us to verse 15. And we read this on Sunday, but let's read it again just so we can finish our discussion of it. Verse 15 down through verse 23. Someone read that. Okay, so again, Paul is continuing to build the case against sin, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with that? He's continuing to build a case against this idea of you can have your sin and have Jesus too. It doesn't work that way. You can't have your cake and eat it too in this situation. You are either 
slave to sin or you are a slave to righteousness. And so you've got that, that contrast or that juxtaposition here, that two extreme that are, that are put in opposition to each other. You cannot have both. You must choose one or the other. And no choice at all is still a choice toward being a slave of sin. Uh, and so that, that's kind of where we're at on some of that. Uh, I had an interesting conversation for my, for my podcast in a couple of weeks uh, about free will. And uh, the gentleman that I was speaking with, one of the things that we, I haven't edited it yet, so I don't know that it'll go into the podcast, but um, it, one of the things we got to talking about was in free will, there is always an easy to see choice. We tend to muddy the waters and try to make things complicated. We overthink things. We try to say there's a lot of gray area. But when you really boil it down to its simplest terms, it's always simple. And we've talked about this before. Even from the very beginning, Adam and Eve were presented with free will, right? They were given a choice. What was the choice? Do what? To eat or not to eat. Well, and, and, and let me kind of uh, twist that a little bit. Not to eat as much as that is, which one will you eat? Chapter 2, and it says, God placed man in the garden. And of the garden, he could eat from anything he wanted. But in the middle of the garden, there were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And you have the commandment about not eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God essentially says, I'm going to give you a thousand things to eat. And this one is, is wonderful. It's the tree of life. But there's this one thing you can't eat. Just one. Don't eat from that one tree. And, and it would, you know, is that a hard choice? I mean, I, I, every time I've ever asked that question, I've never had anybody go, well, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll make excuses like, well, you know, but eventually down the road, eventually somebody's going to make a wrong choice or, or uh, you know, that we'll, we'll come up with all these, these explanations to explain why somebody would make the wrong choice. Does anybody struggle with what was the right or the wrong choice? Anyone? And what's funny is you go through the pages of Scripture, it's, always the case <laughs> the choice the the understanding of what is right versus what is wrong is generally pretty simple what makes it complicated is us we make it complicated we muddy the waters we try to have a little bit of both we want a little bit of the the, the joy of sin if you want to call it that, and we want the joy of righteousness, and we want the, the immediate pleasure of sin and the uh, eventual pleasure of righteousness. And so we start trying to figure out how to have a little bit of everything in our life, and what Paul is showing here is that's just not possible. You are either a slave to God or you are a slave to sin. Only two choices. Uh, and, and again, it, that, and, and again if, if it's not clear which one's the best choice, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is life. There was one tree that was death. There was one tree that was life. Same choice is put in front of us. And that's always been the choice. And, and, and I find that ju to be so interesting that this is, this is the explanation Paul's having to give, you know, essentially make your choice, you know. And, uh, and again, it, it doesn't really matter how we try to justify it. Even look back through some of the arguments that he makes, like verse 21, 
what fruit was produced from the things that you're now ashamed of? Well, he answers the question, what was the fruit of their actions? Shame. <laughs> he gives them the answer there. What was the fruit of pursuing a life of sin? Shame, guilt, problem, difficulties, enslavement. That's what comes when you choose sin. What's the fruit of choosing God? Do what? Eternal life. Eternal life. Okay, what did you say? Eternal life. So, and, and I would even point out there verse 22. But now, since you've been set free from sin, if you choose God, we get freedom. Right? Kind of. You get freedom from sin, but you get enslavement to God. But the eventual outcome of enslavement to God eternal life. And so, again, it, it, it's interesting to see the contrast that he's putting here. Any other thoughts, questions, and additions on that? I think so, yes. Yes, it is. Well, and that was one of the things I asked y'all to do. Did anybody get to do any research on slavery in the first century? Okay, what did y'all find out? Give us an overview. And that was oftentimes preferable. So, yeah. How much? 10%. 10%? Yeah, I mean, it was a lot. Uh, a lot of s slavery. Okay. Any Anything else to add? Yeah. <laughs> They're looking at the same article. No. Yep. So you could marry out of slavery. If you married a free person, you were no longer considered a slave because you now became uh, attached to that new relationship. Um, uh, oftentimes they were granted freedom when they did. Uh, so enslavement in our minds is almost entirely a negative concept. But in the first century, it was not. It was more viewed as indentureship uh, the way we would talk about it, it was being indentured or it would be uh, more like low-level employment. Uh, it's, but instead of getting wages, oftentimes you were given room and board, you were given uh, certain benefits, you had certain, um, certain rights as a slave, uh, which is kind of interesting to us because we think of slavery as losing all rights and that, that wasn't true in the first century. And again, some of this depends on what kind of slave you were and for whom you were a slave. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, the, the concept of slavery was oftentimes, uh, the, the way it was most often talked about was it was something you volunteered for, not necessarily something that you were yanked out of your home and forced into, except in the prisoner of war type situation. Um, and, and so, this idea of Paul talking about slavery here is not the idea of us being forced into following sin or us being forced into following God, but it's, this is what I'm agreeing to do. I'm agreeing because of what I want, what I want my outcome to be, I'm agreeing to serve this master. And so whichever master you submit yourself to, that, to that master you become a slave. Uh, and so that, that's very in keeping with the way first century slavery often worked. Uh, it is hard to find actually good information about first century enslavement because it is often, um, because we again have such a negative connotation to it, it's hard to find stuff that just talks about it factually without 
putting some of those negative spins on it. Uh, but if you go back and look at a lot of the documents that were written from these days, um, there were a lot of uh, fair treatments and rules that, that involved slavery and the setting free of slaves and how you had to treat a slave if they were in your home and, uh, and those types of things. And so, it, 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 again, I would encourage you to look at it more like low-level employment or look at it more like indentureship or apprenticing, that sort of thing. Um, that, that, that's more in keeping with what they would do. Keith, you had your finger up? Yeah. Oppressed, at least, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, we talked about that quite a bit when we were looking, going through the book of Acts, uh, about what it was like to exist under the oppression of another people. And that's something that we don't relate to very well. But for them, I mean, every decision that a ruler would make, if you were oppressed people, like the Jewish people, every decision you made could have dramatic ramifications in the future. Uh, if you upset the people you were responsible to. Well, the same is true for a citizen of Rome. You know, here, a Christian in Rome is not a favored citizen. And so the way they acted, they were an oppressed people, and so they had to act and be careful and cautious in ways that we don't often think about. Any other thoughts, questions on this section before we move on to chapter 7? Because I love talking about chapter 7. All right, well, let's... Uh, Let's move on. All right, chapter 7, somebody read verse 1 down through 6. 1 through 6. Since I am speaking to those who know the law, brothers and sisters, don't you know that the law rules over someone as long as you live? For example, a married woman is legally bound to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law regarding the husband. So then if she is married to another man while her husband is living, she will be caught in adultery. But... If her husband dies, she is free from that law. Then, if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, sinful passions arise through the law that were working in us, in verse 6. Uh, but now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us so that we may serve the newness of the Spirit, not in the old way of the law. Okay. So as you've noticed probably so far as we've gone through the book of Rome, Romans, Paul likes to stack ideas. Have y'all noticed this? So Paul can't just mention something and then move on. He mentioned something, and then he's like, all right, so let's make eight different points about this one idea. And he's doing the same thing here. Back in chapter 6, it began with the idea of what? Dying and new life. Well, who died? Again, you have to be careful with Paul because he talked about dying, living, uh, and I listed a bunch of them for you on Sunday in a lot of different ways. In chapter 6, who's dying? Uh, Christians are dying, not physical death. They are dying as they become Christian. So they are baptized, which means they are dying with Christ and being raised to walk in newness of life. And so you've got a new life. Quit sinning. That's not a part of your new life. The other argument he's going to make here is, so, if you died, you're no longer under obligation, because that was your previous life, right? That was the life you lived as a Jew, that you were responsible to this law, but you died. So are you any longer responsible to a law that ruled over you in your old life? Not according to Paul. Okay. Chris? Yes, I believe so. 
so here, you know, and, and the reason I say that is because I'm speaking to those who know the law. So the law here in context is the Mosaic law. These are people, the previously Jews, who knew the law. Uh, they know in that law there's this rule about the responsibility of a man to be committed to his wife as long as they are alive. But if one of them dies, the law sets them free from that covenant and they can go marry another. Well, in this case, you died. So you are no longer committed to the law that you were married to. That covenant is over, and you are free to marry another. Well, what is the, the another in this situation? Christ, the new covenant. You were married to the old covenant. Now you're married to the new covenant. So you were put to, this is verse 4, you were put to death in relation to the law, through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. Well, the other we're going to belong to is Jesus. And he's going to not spend a ton of time talking about that yet. He's going to spend a lot more time talking about why this is a good thing that you've died to the law. Okay? Now, I know that is a, a strange way of thinking about it, isn't it? And, and I think the reason we struggle with that is because we don't think about what we died to literally and what we're born and what is possible in a new life. Because in our minds, we think so physically, I've been alive for 42 years now. But technically speaking, when I was 13 years old, I died. And I was raised to walk a new life, which technically speaking means I'm what, 29? Yeah! So, that's why I feel so good these days, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, that, but, but that's kind of, we look at that and go, that's convoluted argue, or, you know, an ar convoluted argument. It, it kind of is. But what Paul, I'm, and again, I'm not saying it's an invalid argument when I say it's convoluted. Don't take me the wrong way there. It is not a typical way to argue this point. Typically, when we talk about it, we talk about the law being put to death, right? Have you, haven't you had that discussion? Okay, and we, we base that off of, like, Colossians, where it talks about the handwriting of requirement was nailed to the cross. And so we talk about the law being put to death. Paul's not making that argument here. Paul's saying, you died, and therefore you're no longer committed to this, this thing you were married to called the law, and you are freed to be married to something else. Why do you think he makes that argument here as opposed to the argument he makes in Colossians 2 about the law dying? Because couldn't that have worked too? To say we, you know, the law is no longer a, a valid thing to even be concerned about because it's dead? Had he done that? Maybe so. Um, I do think there's some of that, of, of the idea of, I think had he argued the law was null and void, he would have lost some of his audience here because they were so committed to the law. Uh, so I do think there's a sense in which that, that is absolutely true. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah. So I really think it's just a following through with the context that he's building. You've died, so you've died to sin. You've also died to the law. And he's going to talk about a little bit more death before we're done with this, okay? But that idea of Paul's argument is based off of the concept that he built at the beginning of chapter 6, which was you died. You died. You've been raised to walk a brand new life. That should look different than your old life. And one of the things you died to was sin. Another thing you died to was the law. So he doesn't have to 
toss the law into the, into the rubbish bin at this point. That, that's not a concern of his. He's already built the case for you died. Uh, and, and also, he uses the old law to validate his point here that they died to the old law. So how do you use the old law to validate something if you're going to also argue that the old law was null and void? You see what I'm saying? So it's actually a, a it is less convoluted, it's actually much more logical the way he argues this. The reason we find it a little bizarre is because it's not the way we normally think about the relationship between the Jews and the law. We tend to think of it as the Jews lost the law because the law was put to the was taken to the cross, and that's true. But that's not the argument that Paul's making here. Okay, everybody with me on all that? I know. It's, 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 I find this kind of like figuring the thing out exciting. Everybody else is probably like, I don't move on. So, um, so he moves back to the idea of, of, of sin here. Uh, when you get down to verse 4, 5, and 6, verse 5 in particular. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused through the law were working in us to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law since we died to what held us, so that we may serve in newness of spirit and not in the old letter of the law. He's going to move on to talk about that in much more detail. But what he is essentially doing is he is, as Paul commonly does, he stacks ideas and then he kind of pushes the whole sandwich together and says, let's, let's, let's start taking bites of this whole thing. And, and that's kind of what he's done here. He's, he's stacked all the pieces together, and now he's kind of pressing it down and saying, all right, now let's, let's, let's talk about this whole thing as a whole, okay? The idea that you are dead to sin, but you didn't know sin until the law revealed sin. But once the law revealed sin, you died. But then you had to die again because you, were, you, you decided to belong to Christ which calls you to be raised to walk in newness of life, which means you're dead to the old stuff, uh, which means you're alive to new stuff. Like, you start doing this, and you're like, whoa! Like, you know, how many layers of sandwich do we have here? But he, he's going to move forward with that here uh, in chapter 7. So just kind of take all the stuff we've talked about since the beginning of chapter 4, and he's going to kind of wrap some things up here for us at, by the end of chapter 7. Okay? So, somebody read the next section. Chapter 7, verse 7 through 13. Keep going through 13. Okay. Whew, here we go. So I'm, we're going to, let, let me start with a disclaimer that this section cannot be understood on its own. Meaning it, it presents an incomplete picture. I don't apologize for that because I don't think Paul is trying to present a complete picture with one paragraph. He is building an argument. Okay? And you don't really get to the end of that argument until you get to the end of chapter 8. This section here 
cannot be understood independent of some of the things he's going to talk about in chapter 8. But we're going to talk about it, and we're going to talk about it, and it's going to make you go, well, if that's true, then what about? Don't do that. Okay? Because the what about are not going to apply by the time we get to the end of chapter 8. Does that make sense? I know you don't know what I'm talking about yet, but do you understand the caution, at least? Okay? And, and I'll throw a what about at you in just a moment to let you realize what I'm saying we can't actually answer only from this section of Scripture. Keisha? Yes, yes, no. Paul's wordy? What? No. So, yes, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you can't understand any of it. My point is, this sec- I've seen people over and over and over again draw what-if scenarios from this section of Scripture to the absence of all the other things that Paul's saying around this scripture. So I'm just cautioning you not to do that, okay? Because I do think there is a statement made here by Paul that out of context leads down some really bad roads, okay? And I I always want to make sure we're staying in context here. So Paul is saying, uh, what what is verse 7 and 8 talking about in 9? Verse 7, 8, and 9 particularly. Yeah, I, they do. So let go ahead, Steve. You're misunderstanding. Yeah. Yeah. So the easiest way for me and my simple minded brain to make sense of this section of scripture is to put it. Uh, kind of in a, a timeline, okay? What you have here presented is essentially a scenario. There is a time, verse 9, where you are alive apart from the law. When is that? Okay, childhood. I would even maybe expand that to the statement you made a second ago, which is ignorance. Okay, there, there's a time when you are alive without an awareness of the law or without a knowledge of the law or without an understanding of the law. 
Okay, and so I think, yes, childhood, I think Paul particularly is speaking of his own childhood here. Uh, there was a time before I was aware of the law. Okay, then the commandment came. What does that mean? He understood. He learned it. He learned the rules. He learned what the law said. He learned what was right and wrong. He learned what God said was moral and immoral. He, he understood all of a sudden, for instance, the Ten Commandments, because he uses one of those as an example here, right? You shall not covet. And so he becomes uh, aware of the law, knowledgeable of the law. He understands the law. When that happened, what was the result? Sin sprang to life, and I died. Okay, that, and, and the best way that I have to relate this, again, from a biblical perspective is Adam and Eve. And I think the point of the nakedness of Adam and Eve is this very point that Paul's making here. They were naked, running around the garden, having fun together, taking care of the garden, doing the things that, that, that a naked husband and wife would probably be doing in a garden, you know, that, that, that they're just, they're, they're enjoying life together. They had no idea they were naked. And the implication there in Genesis chapter 2, they were naked and unashamed. Well, we've already talked about the law created shame, sin creates shame. So they were naked, and the implication there is they were unashamed, even though they should have been ashamed. Because us reading this after we've come to a knowledge of the law, we see people running around naked as a shameful thing. We're not supposed to be naked, right? I see everyone in here with clothes on. Thank you. Appreciate that. I mean, we, we wear clothes because it's shameful to not wear clothes. Adam and Eve didn't know that. They didn't have those rules yet, and so they were unashamed. As soon as they ate from the tree of the fruit of no, that had uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they ate that fruit. It says what about them? Their eyes were open. They or they saw that they were naked, and they felt ashamed. Their circumstances of the way they were physically hadn't changed. What had changed for Adam and Eve? Knowledge. They had knowledge of good and evil. And knowledge immediately produced in them shame that they didn't have before, even though they were physically in the exact same situation. Correct? Everybody with me on this? So... In Adam and Eve's case, they were alive apart from the law, but when the law came, when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and they were and they died. That, that, that's what happened with Adam and Eve. Now we can get into debates as to why would it be shameful to be naked if it's just a husband and wife and all of those kind of uh, or, you know, questions we ask about the text. Uh, which I have my own personal take on some of those things. But ultimately, that is an example of exactly what Paul's talking about here. Ignorance of the law causes you to not understand that there is sin and there is shame attached to that sin and death attached to that sin. Now, it might not change the activity, but it changes the awareness of the consequences of the activity. Does that make sense? Somebody with me here? And I would even dare say it changes the culpability of the people who are engaging in the activity. Because when Adam and Eve were running around the garden naked, was God condemning them from heaven about that? No. It wasn't until they knew it was shameful that now God says, who told you you were naked? Remember that conversation there in the garden? And so God was not imputing guilt on them. Some of your versions use that word here in the text, right? The, it, it, sin or guilt was not imputed 
God had not imputed guilt to them. And, and I think you can make the case here even with Paul. What Paul is teaching is that when ignorant of the law, sin, the guilt of sin and the punishment of sin was not imputed to me, I, I, I didn't suffer the consequences of it yet. But once I knew the law, then I realized the sin that I had been committing, and that became sin. It became a cause for death in me. So back up to verse 7. For example, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. And sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, my assumption, and you might disagree with me on this, the coveting was happening before he knew the law. He just didn't know it was coveting until he knew the law. And at that point, the commandment seized that opportunity and caused a greater desire for sin, as, as Steve was talking about earlier, or in, in what he talks about a little bit later, verse 13, but sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good. And so that idea of it, it brought me to culpability, it imputed me with guilt, covered me with guilt, and it caused me to be completely shameful because now I knew all the things I had been doing wrong. Okay, and, and, and you see this happen with your children, do you not? Uh, the, any of us who have raised children or are currently raising children, there are oftentimes things they do wrong, and then you go have a conversation with them about why what they did was wrong. They didn't know it, but as soon as they realize what they had done was wrong, what do you see happen to them? Remorse, guilt, shame, and that's not rules they broke after they knew the rules. Those are rules they broke before they knew the rules, but once they knew the rules, it kind of retroactively produce guilt and shame because they recognize I had, I've, I've been doing wrong. Does that make sense? And I think Paul's point here is to show that all of us are sinful. Go back to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Romans 6, 23. All of us are guilty, no matter how innocent we want to claim we are, that we've kept the law. I've, I've kept all the laws. Did you always keep all the laws? Did you break laws before you knew they were laws? Because those things are guilt, those things provide you guilt too. Once you know they're wrong, you're wrong. Uh, and so you've, you've got that sense of, I think Paul is again building a greater case for the sinfulness of this people, that, that you are truly sinful. Uh, so the problem there is not the law. All the law is doing is giving out the information. The problem is that we have broken the law both after we received the commandments and before we received the commandments. We broke those laws. Uh, and that's what causes us to suffer with this inner turmoil uh, that he's going to move on and talk about. Any questions, thoughts? Again, I, I don't, you know, that is a, uh, there are some assumptions built into that interpretation, and I, I recognize that. So that's why I'm trying to be careful with the way I, I present this. Let me give you the, the big what about situation, okay, that, that often gets talked about from this passage of Scripture. If we are not imputed for our sins before we know what is right and wrong, then we should just not teach people right and wrong. Does that work? No. And let me tell you why it doesn't work, and we're going to come back to this when we get to chapter 8. Because being right before God is not about how well I have kept the law. Being right with God is about the relationship I have with God. And if I never learn about right and wrong, will I have a relationship with God? No. This is why the law is good. The law leads us to Jesus. It leads us 
to our need for Jesus, and it leads us to have an understanding of who God is and what God's expectations are. So the issue here is not, can we ignorize people into heaven? Yes, I made that word up. But you know exactly what I mean by it, right? I learned that when I went, uh, got high. The farther you go in college, you can start making up your own words, and they love you for it. It's hilarious. As long as they know what you're talking about, they're like, fantastic, check mark. You never get away with that in high school, but I did in college quite a bit. So uh, you, you can... Uh, you, you cannot get somebody to heaven with ignorance. It's not the way it works. Because going to heaven is not about law-keeping. That's Paul's point here. None of us can claim that we've kept the law good enough. Because even if we have been the most conscientious people, uh, obedient people ever, we broke laws before we knew they were laws. But we can uh, use the law to bring us to Jesus. And that, that's really where Paul is going with some of this stuff. He is, again, taking every explanation on the table and dropping a big red X on every single argument they're going to make. And then we're going to start over kind of a, at square one in chapter eight with, and here's how to do it right. Here, here's the benefit of truly knowing Jesus. Steve? Nope. I'm saying we become, we experience guilt once we come to know the law. That does not mean God is holding us guilty for that lie I told when I was three years old. Because at that point I didn't know. But if I am, and again to use the illustration of kids, if, uh, um, I'm trying to think of a real life scenario. At one point, um, No, I don't want to use any real life scenarios because those would be embarrassing for my children. So, Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, and again, I what my point is, or, or what I think Paul's point here is, that there are things that we learn later, and they are things that we have broken before we learn them. We become guilty of those things when we gain the knowledge. So at that point, God is holding us guilty. So to, you know, at what a three-year-old understands as right and wrong, they are going to be held to that standard. Uh, what it, but not necessarily by God. I mean, I'm not arguing that a three-year-old that, that did something that they knew was wrong, they talked back to mom, that, well, now they're going to hell. Like, that, that's just, they, they did a bad thing, and they're, they're going to hell. You know, at some point, you become aware of God's law. And when you become aware of God's law, it will produce in you all manner of guilt of the ways you have broken God's law, which drives you to that need for Jesus. That, that's my point here, and the point that I think Paul's making here. Chris? Chris? 
But I think, so my understanding of that is this, and, and we can talk about this further on Sunday. Um, my understanding about that would be this. That deals with this very topic here in chapter 7. The major consequence of Adam's sin that affected the world was knowledge of good and evil had now been exposed to the world. Well, what do we know that knowledge of the law creates? Sin. And so that idea of the consequence of Adam's sin is not necessarily we bear Adam's guilt. The consequence of Adam's sin is that we now suffer under the same knowledge of good and evil that revealed his sin and reveals our sins. Uh, and so that, but we can talk about that more on Sunday just because all the ladies are waiting. So uh, we will, we'll go back and talk about that Sunday because I do think these two passages are very related. So thank you.